I was a horse crazy child. That's me, the cute one in blonde there. <laughs> and I grew up to become a horse crazy adult. Riding horses, training them, competing, just being with them is one of the great and sustaining passions of my life. Like Winston Churchill, I believe that no hour of life is wasted that is spent in the saddle. But don't tell my chair. <laughs> so, anyway, so I grew up also to become an ecologist, and science became one of the great passions of my life. I also love my husband and my kids, but today I'm going to talk about horses and science. So more specifically, I'm a science educator, which means I've spent most of my professional life thinking about how I could communicate this passion, how I can impart this in my students, how I can help them on their journey to become scientists, or at least to become engaged and motivated thinkers. So I'm an educator. What does the word educate mean? Well, it's derived from a Latin root, educare, which is composed of two ideas, ex, to bring out, and ducere, to lead. This is a beautiful concept because it counteracts the idea that education is a stuffing full of knowledge. It's the idea that we lead out, we bring out something innate in our students. Keats has a lovely quote where he says, education is the lighting of a fire, not a filling of a pail. It reflects the same idea. And so I reflect on this word quite a lot. And I think about what I want to lead out, what I want to bring out of my students. What do I want my students to become? I want them to be brave. I want my students to be confident and independent thinkers. I want them to leave here armed with an intellectual toolkit that will allow them to take on the wicked problems of the world with confidence and belief in themselves. I want them to be dreamers. I want them to be questioners. I want them to be innovators. And I think if you asked any other professor, you would get some kind of variation of this idea. The idea that we're not in the business of producing automatons that are going to fall off the end of the production line with their heads crammed full of some kind of static and rapidly becoming obsolete knowledge. What we want are innovators. We want abstract thinkers. We want uh, collaborators. We want adventurers. In short, we want problem solvers. Lord knows the world needs problem solvers. But we struggle with this mandate. We struggle to engage our students. We struggle to encourage them to take intellectual risks. We struggle to bring out their best potential in themselves. We struggle sometimes to get students to trust us, to believe that we're on their side. Far too many students actually have this sort of medieval scenario of university, where we are cast, the faculty, as somehow the gatekeepers of the ivory tower, standing there saying, none shall pass. <laughs> you know, and we throw out the, you know, the pitfalls and the roadblocks and the dragons to slay. And once you make it through this perilous journey, you will emerge victorious or not at all. And if you do, you can rightfully claim your prize, the holy grail, otherwise known as a diploma. <laughs> this is a depressing vision. And this is something I struggle with. And as I struggle with this, my worlds start to collide. So the equestrian discipline that I adhere to is called three-day eventing. It's composed of three phases, dressage, stadium jumping, and cross-country jumping. Now, it arose from a military tradition where cavalry officers would compete to show off their equestrian skills but mostly the skills of the mounts that they trusted to carry them into battle, and more importantly, to carry them out alive. So when you think about the attributes of a war horse, some might be fairly obvious. Strength, speed, athleticism, endurance. But there are some that are perhaps not so obvious. A soldier on a battlefield does not want an obedient robot. He wants a partner. He wants a partner that is a brave and confident problem solver. He wants an animal that is going to be able to take the skills that it has learned and be able to make good judgments and apply them on the fly without much help. A rider's life, quite literally, depends on a horse's ability to problem solve, whether it means solving a tricky combination of jumps or keeping their rider balanced over changing terrain and slippery footing. Good event horses are sometimes said to have a fifth leg, 
Not literally, it's, you know, it's not actually on their body. What we mean by a fifth leg is this elusive quality where they have an almost uncanny ability to keep themselves safe, keep themselves out of trouble, and most importantly, keep their riders safe. This is a very valuable partner on a battlefield indeed. Now, I don't want to mislead you. I'm not in any of those pictures. <laughs> I'm nowhere near the caliber of the riders in those pictures. But I'm loving my own eventing journey. My flunked out cart horse and I, neither of us with much talent, both of us with a lot of gumption and try. Together we're learning. Together we're on a journey where we're becoming brave and confident problem solvers together. And this is where I had my light bulb moment. I thought, if I, a mediocre amateur horse trainer, can take a 1,500 pound flighty prey animal with a brain the size of a tennis ball and inspire it to become a brave and confident problem solver, why am I struggling to do this with my students? Now, before you get excited, I have not decided that I'm changing my curriculum and making all my students jump ditches. I do understand that the skill set of an event horse and of a university graduate are considerably different. But I do want you to consider that a lot of the challenges of getting from point A to point B are similar in both of these journeys. We need to build trust. We need to overcome fear. We need to overcome fear of failure. We need to inspire joy in your work, the satisfaction that comes from working hard, and the character and integrity that comes with being able to overcome adversity. So as I ponder this, I came to the realization that what I really needed to know about teaching, I learned from my horse. So what are these lessons? The first one is you can't learn if you're scared. David Diamond and his group at the University of South Florida have been conducting research on the effects of fear and learning using rats as a model. And they showed that when rats are exposed to a fearful stressor, a fear-inducing stressor, a cat in this situation, their ability to both retain and to create new memories is significantly impaired. Other studies have shown that there's a physical basis for this, that there's actual changes in the hippocampus, the part of the brain that is involved in long-term memory storage and retrieval, that we see morphological changes in the cell. Fear is toxic to the learning process. Horse trainers may not know the science behind this, but they sure know the consequences of ignoring this. They know that inspiring fear in a horse, causing a fearful, single fearful episode sometimes, is enough to set training back weeks, months, years, sometimes permanently. And so good trainers also recognize that fear doesn't always manifest itself as fear. Fear comes out in all sorts of ways. Fear comes out as stubbornness. Fear comes out as opposition. Fear comes out as evasion, belligerence, even aggression. I know of a horse trainer who says, if I'm breaking a colt and the colt misbehaves, I roll up a newspaper, whack myself, and say, bad trainer. Because a good trainer recognizes that their responsibility is to create a fear-free learning environment. So what about the misbehaviors we see in our students? What do professors complain about? Well, lots of things. They don't want to think. They just want the answers. They're lazy. They don't want to work hard. They're obsessed with marks. They just nitpick. They're always suspicious, think we're trying to trap them and trick them. Why don't we look at this in the filter of fear? And more importantly, given that we know how toxic fear is to the learning process, why do we perpetuate a culture of fear in our educational system? Belligerence, suspicion, lack of trust, unwillingness to be adventurous in your thinking, these are all symptoms of coming from a fear-based system. So what are students so afraid of? University is a very stressful environment, and there's some stresses that will never go away. Economic stresses social stresses, the stresses of leaving home, the stresses of changing and growing into an adult. And the fears that students uh, articulate to me and in other forums are pretty poignant. Am I smart enough? Do I belong here? Am I prepared enough? Will I let my family down? Will I let myself down? 
What happens if I fail? Some students walk through these doors with the weight of generations of hopes and dreams on their shoulders. And many of these students are also products of a system that perpetuates the myth that failure is the opposite of success, rather than a necessary and repeated step on the road to success. A system that perpetuates the myth that complex questions have simple answers, and somebody will tell you those answers, and you memorize those answers, and you repeat those answers on an exam to pass through those portals. It perpetuates the myth that being wrong is the worst thing you can be. Is it any wonder that a student from this system would arrive here in a state of intellectual near paralysis, terrified of putting a foot wrong, suspicious of traps and, and tricks wherever they step. So how do we combat this toxic stew of fear that we're subjecting our students to? One way is be a good horseman. Be positive. Be kind. Be clear in your expectations. Be respectful of everybody's starting points. Build trust wherever you can. Build relationships wherever you can. Rita Pearson, in a, talk, a TED talk that she gave um, just earlier this year, has this beautiful line where she spoke to a teacher, and the teacher said, my job is not to get the kids to like me. My job is to teach the lesson. And she looked at her and said, you know people don't learn from people they don't like. It's important to build relationships. In the classroom, if something's not working, don't blame the students. Try a different approach. Break things into small, uh, you know, manageable steps. It build a learning environment that is conducive to learning without fear. John Lyons is a famous horseman who gives clinics all around the world. And he says, there's only two emotions that belong in the saddle. One is a sense of humor, and the other is patience. I think this applies pretty well to the classroom as well. Reward the try. Praise and positive reinforcement have become kind of suspect concepts in our idea of an, sort of an entitled culture where everybody gets a trophy. But we should never confuse real praise with these empty accolades. Real praise is what nurtures the soul, what feeds the heart. Real praise is what tells somebody, I believe in you. It doesn't say, you're done, you're finished, you've completed your journey. It's, you're not there yet, but I believe you will get to that finish line. I have faith in you. That kind of encouragement is what inspires people to go on, and we forget this on a daily basis. The 19th century horseman Francois Baucher said, ask often, be content with little, and reward lavishly. So in this, he understands and communicates the idea that this is not dumbing down or lowering your expectations. Ask often, ask a lot, demand a lot of your students, but be happy when they're trying. Reward them, encourage them for that try. Reward lavishly. Just recently, I've started a practice where I send out personal emails to students who have done well on the monthly quizzes in my online uh, first year class. There's over 800 students in the class, so it's a bit of a time consuming job, but it's incredibly rewarding. And in fact, I'm embarrassed that first off, it wasn't my idea. And second of all, it's taken me so long to understand the importance of this. I'm flabbergasted at the responses I get from students. Most of them write back to say, I can't believe you noticed that I did well. Thank you. Some said, how do you know my name? And I thought, I have a class list. You know? <laughs> but, you know, so, but they're that flabbergasted to be getting a personal message saying, hey, good job. That's all it is. What if the achievement isn't that great? You can always find something good. In the same talk that Rita Pearson gave, she mentioned having to give a student two out of 20 on a test. Two out of 20. Yikes, what do you say? So she put a plus beside the two to think it made it look better. And then she drew a smiley face to make it better. And the student came up to her afterwards and said, Ms. Pearson, isn't this an F? And she said, yeah, it is. And he said, why'd you put a smiley face on? And she said, you didn't miss them all. You know, you got two. I think you're on a roll. And I think next time you're going to do better. He said, yeah. <laughs> this is how you build confidence. This is how you build belief. When you tell others you believe in them, 
they start to believe in themselves for the right reasons. Embrace failure. We need to get our students to embrace failure. In almost every endeavor in life, we expect to fail. Even more, we, we want to fail. When we're learning an instrument, when we're learning a sport, when we're doing any kind of activity, we expect that we're going to fail. And in fact, as I say, if we don't fail, we get frustrated. Can you imagine signing up for a series of ski lessons and you never left the baby hill, you never fell down? You'd be frustrated. You'd say, I didn't learn anything. If you were signed up for piano lessons and all you did was play Mary Had a Little Lamb faultlessly week after week after week, you'd quit and find a better teacher. We expect to fail. We want to fail. Greg mentioned in the previous talk about Malcolm Gladwell's book, Outliers, where he talks about the 10,000 hour rule. It takes 10,000 hours to master a complex skill. By logical extension, you spend 9,999 of those hours not in mastery of that skill. In other words, failing to some extent. But yet this doesn't paralyze us. In my Environment 100 class, the first assignment requires students to write a hypothesis based on a previous experiment. Some students take this in stride. For some, it's terrifying. And they come to me and they say, Professor, what if my hypothesis is wrong? And I say, well, then you're in very good company because Newton was wrong about some things. Darwin was wrong about some things. Stephen Hawking was wrong about some things. So good for you. Good scientists are wrong on a regular basis, so you're starting your career off on the right foot. But it's the truth. Ken Robinson, in another TED Talk, has this wonderful quote. If you're not prepared to be wrong, you'll never come up with anything original. In science, there is no need to fear wrongness. Richard Dawkins has a beautiful anecdote that, if you're in one of my classes, I'm sure you've already heard me recount. He talks about his undergraduate days at Oxford, where there was an old professor in his department, he was a biologist, who had sort of staked his career on denying the existence of a particular cell organelle. He just didn't believe that it existed. He thought that when people saw it on grainy micrographs, that it was simply an artifact of preservation. A young visiting scientist came to Oxford and gave a talk where he showed some really advanced microscope images that incontrovertibly showed that this cell structure did exist. The audience kind of glanced nervously at this old professor, wondering if he was going to stand up and bluster and say, this is heresy and, you know, this is nonsense and so on. At the end of the talk, the scientist ran down to the podium, grabbed the hand of the visiting scientist and pumped it, saying, my dear fellow, I wish to thank you. I've been wrong for 15 years. The fear of failure is so ingrained in academic culture and we need to lose it. It's so liberating to move out from under the tyranny of rightness. This is a legacy we need to give our students. We need to give them freedom to fail. Don't forget the joy. Sometimes people think about why students sometimes struggle in school, are resistant to learning. And a lot of times people will say, well, it's hard. People don't want to do things that are hard. It's too much work. They're lazy. That's why they don't like it. I don't think that's true at all. People are willing to work hard if they love what they do. And if you doubt this, spend some time on YouTube where it's full of people who do all kinds of crazy things with very little fame at the end of it but some internal satisfaction. You have to work pretty hard to go through all of Barack Obama's speeches to find the individual words that make up the lyrics to Carly Rae Jepsen's Call Me Maybe and mash it up together. That is a lot of work. So don't tell me that guy's not willing to work hard. To work hard, you've got to love what you do. And this becomes apparent when you work with horses. You don't make a thousand pound animal do something that it doesn't want to do unless you use fear, brutality, and coercion. This doesn't create a happy working relationship. Horses try their heart outs for us. They run races. They go into battle. They jump solid obstacles into water. Why? Not because we make them, 
but we lead out from them something inside them that makes them want to do it. They trust us. They want to follow us. They feel a competitive fire in themselves. You lead that passion out in a horse. You can definitely lead passion out in a student. In my own equestrian journey, I've had so many setbacks, roadblocks, failures, uh, do-overs, go back to square ones that I've lost count. But I don't give up. Because deep inside, I'm still that horse-crazy little girl. And I honor her by coming back to the joy that I always felt and still feel now. For you as students, for all of us, we need to lead out in ourselves that joy, that path that we take ourselves to success. It needs to be a joyful path. And that's what makes the hard work, the sacrifice, the frustrations worthwhile. When I see my brave and confident learners leave these hallowed halls off to face the wicked problems of the world, I know it's been worthwhile. Thank you.